Donna. Hi, David. How are you? Oh, excited to be here. Happy yeah. to be here with you. Yeah, thank you. We are here in, in, in Bilbao with Donna Martin, a yeah, legacy mm. holder of, of the Hakomi work mm. from Broncourt. You've been doing Hakomi for how many years? <laughs> How many Since years? I was and I don't very young. Remember. <laughs> yeah, I met Ron Kurtz in 1990, and he was teaching Hakomi at a retreat center that I was teaching yoga at, and we instantly recognized a similarity because of our backgrounds, our backgrounds in yoga, Buddhism, Feldenkrais, psychotherapy. So we actually started teaching together right away. Because you, you, you had been a yoga teacher for a, yes. for a while already, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. So we started with Hakomi and yoga workshops while I took the Hakomi training, and that, was, that began in 1990. So it's been a long time. Well, and, and you're the author of what I think for a Spanish reader, this is a jewel, you know, about Hakomi, is mindfulness in el cuerpo, el espíritu de Hakomi, la psicoterapia como práctica espiritual. And you have another book, another new book, right? I have another new book, just hot off the press, uh, The Practice of Loving Presence. Ron, 15 years before he died, suggested that he and I write this book together. Um, we'd already been creating this practice, and, and the trainings were based on the practices from Loving Presence, as you know. Um, but. It was, it was difficult, it was challenging to write the book because there was so much still being created. So it was after his death that I came back to the book and the first thing I did was gather all the material and put them on the website as ebooks. And I always had the idea that the material needed to be condensed into a nice little book in print for anybody, not just Takomi students and it's finally complete, so I'm very excited about that. Okay. Yeah, yeah and, and me as a Hakomi student, I'm also a Hakomi teacher, mm -hmm. uh, I've been thinking a lot about what we have called with, uh, with George as well, the, the ultimate paradox. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And because uh, Hakomi is a way of transformation, isn't it? It yeah. is, yeah. And yeah. People, people come to our work uh, with a desire for transformation and we are uh, witnessing transformation mm -hmm. over and over again. Mm -hmm. And at the same time we work with some principles about mm -hmm. staying with what is, mm -hmm. accepting the other person just as mm -hmm. she or he is. Mm -hmm. And there's a little paradox there, right? Yeah. So what happens if we just accept what is and stay with that? and well, the beautiful thing about life is that everything changes anyway. You know, life is change. Nothing stays as it is. So in Hakomi, we're not pretending or imagining that everything will stay and everything is okay just as it is. It's more about our presence with what is in each moment. And each moment is part of an evolution which is transformation and change. I think, you know, years ago I re realized that the way I think about healing is that it's the verb of wholeness. In English, you know, wholeness is the noun, healing is the verb. So I thought, I think it's a mistake to think that healing is the change um, or transformation toward wholeness. I decided for myself that Wholeness is intrinsic, and part of wholeness is that it's, it's constantly evolving. And so I think of healing as wholeness happening. Wholeness is happening, and it's happening in what we call transformation because nothing stays the same. But if the change that's happening uh, can be supported in the direction toward what we call healing, I think it's in the direction toward um, more um, aliveness, more nourishment, more health, you know? So um, obviously change can move in the wrong direction mm -hmm. towards something that is, um, takes people into suffering, 
Yeah, I was going to ask. Uh, yeah. I was going to ask you about that. No? What happened with the unnecessary suffering right. that we talk about so often? You know? Right. I, I think that's you know what both Buddhism and Hakomi and hopefully other forms of therapy are are paying attention to is um, of what's going on in somebody's life that's challenging and painful. What part of that is unnecessary? Uh, I, I worked with a man in one of my um, groups. He was in, in an addiction group. He was an alcoholic in recovery. But he was in so much pain, and I didn't have much time with him. I was, I was just working with the group and not with the individuals. But he came up to me afterwards and he said, you know, this all started, this, this suffering, this alcoholism, this, this part of my life that's just falling apart. It all started with a terrible tragedy and the tragedy was that he was riding um, he was driving a big machine uh, and his young child his three-year-old was playing and he didn't see him and he drove over him and killed him mm. I mean I can't imagine as a parent I can't imagine anything more you know anguishing than that uh, what happened for him was that he he was just so devastated by that that he couldn't function anymore and he went into this uh, darkness that we call addiction and was in terrible terrible suffering but was you know starting to recover and and I said to him something that was very blunt and it wasn't in a Hakomi session at all but it was the kind of thing that I think we need to pay attention to when we're working with people who are suffering I said to him, you know, I just can't even imagine the grief that you must be feeling. But you're feeling guilt, and it's in the way of the grieving. Oh, yeah. the, the guilt is unnecessary. That w it wasn't your fault. And if you keep spending your energy feeling guilty, in a way you're not honoring your son. You're not honoring him by grieving fully. So it's not about no suffering in a way, it's what, what's unnecessary about the suffering. And moving the person toward, you know, the transformation for him um, was still painful, uh, but it was, you know, in a way supporting him to pay attention to what was real and what was important. So that as he was in his healing process, his recovery, his transformation, he wasn't going to stop grieving, but he could grieve properly. Yeah, yeah. I, wanna, I was going to ask you about that. You know what happened with those sufferings that we cannot avoid, or, or we cannot change, or we can. Absolutely. What Let, do we do with that? And and you know, in Hakomi, we talk about paying attention to how we relate to ourselves, to others, to life. The, the word Hakomi, as you know, the archaic translation of the word that was chosen to describe this work means how do you stand in relation to these many realms? How do you stand in relation to everything? How, how we are relating to what happens to us creates either unnecessary suffering or allows us to move through the change that's inevitable. You know, life is inevitable change. There's going to be pain, there's going to be loss, there's going to be um, feeling, moments of feeling sadness or anger. Or all of these emotions are energy moving through us that changes from one moment to the next, like the weather. You know, it's weather, it's nature. How do we relate to what's happening and how can I change my relationship so that it doesn't cause me unnecessary suffering? Yeah, and, and relating with this, this um, idea of transformation, I know, I know very well your, your work and you work a lot with the bodily expression of anything, you know, the embodiment mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. whatever is happening. Mm -hmm. and, and yeah, and how do you use that for transformation? Oh, I'm glad you asked me that because I think this is such a direct access it's route. so powerful, so simple, huh? It is. <laughs> you know, first of all, back up a little bit and make sure that people understand that 
um, that our role when we're being with somebody in a Hakomi way, uh, as the therapist, as the practitioner, as the spiritual friend in a way, is, uh, is not trying to make anything happen. We're not, uh, we're so convinced that the, this principle of organicity, that, it, that, that what's natural is change, that's what, what's natural is healing, wholeness happening, that what we're, how we see our role is we, we're uh, witnessing and helping to contain that and helping to support what wants to happen, we call it. In that regard, we don't want to change anything. We don't want to change anything, but we're realizing that everything is changing. Uh -huh. Things are changing. So we're not trying to make change, mm -hmm. but we're wanting to assist the person to be conscious about the way they're relating to what's happening so that they have some choice about, actually it's, it's more than anything, it's choice about their response to the changes that are happening in their life. You know, uh, in a way you can think of it very simplistically as going from being reactive on automatic knee-jerk reaction, creating, recreating the same experiences over and over in our life. Because our experience is not what's happening. It's our relationship with what's happening. It's how what's happening is experienced inside each of us. I sometimes used to tell a group, uh, I give them an example of if there were few people trapped in an elevator. I used to say this with the, the addicts, for example. You make the, the ideas really accessible by suggesting something that they may have experienced. I said, you know, any of you ever been trapped in an elevator? You know, and a group of them, several would put up their hands and I said, well, what did you do? And what did you do? And what did you do? You know, and it was everything from one guy, you know, getting out a, a pocket knife and trying to fix the panel and, and somebody else, this was before cell phones, a long time ago, before mobiles. So somebody else cracking jokes, you know, somebody else getting all upset and, and banging and somebody else laid down in the corner and fell asleep. You know, same event, different experiences for each person. Mm -hmm. And we have a style in the, you know, we, we develop habits of how we organize experiences. So, you know, the guy that was cracking jokes, that wasn't the first time he'd ever done that. That was a habit he had in a way he'd practiced strategizing around or coping with whatever stressful events were happening. And same with the guy who decided to curl up on the floor and fall asleep. You know, you can imagine the challenges he would have in a relationship or his partner would have with him in a relationship you know and I put it in that context oh I bet you know at home does your wife ever get upset because you just withdraw and disappear and fall asleep when she's trying to deal with something and he goes he thought I was psychic you know but the way we do things is the yeah. way we do things until we become aware of it and consider other possibilities of how to respond to the life events and and all of all of that is embodied it's, it's, and it's expressing all the time in the body yeah so you brought me back to that good for you yes yeah, <laughs> yeah but i was thinking in an example of mine you know yeah. like uh, for example if i present myself to the world as smaller than i am yes. if i do that bodily yes. you know yeah. yeah it's expressing something right not just that i do my body smaller than it is right right and the thing is when well, you work a lot with this you know if i change that yeah and i do, i mm -hmm. stop doing it bodily or mm -hmm. I, I change everything um rearrange itself that's it, right it's it? like or it, reorganize itself to, to that expression that body expression right? in a way we're embodying a virtual reality where we're we're walking around um we're not just organizing our coping response or reaction to whatever happens to us in life but we're we're walking around and you can you can see it you can begin to watch for it you can see in a coffee shop for example you can begin to imagine the kind of reality the person lives in you know are they 
do they look like they don't feel safe? You know, it's not just in that coffee shop they don't feel safe. Um, do they do they come in with a kind of uh, bearing as if they know they're going to be welcomed, uh, or do they come in as if they feel like they'll be invisible? You know, it's not the first time when you see somebody that they're embodying uh, a, a reality that they're imagining and that they've carried probably from childhood. And w what we're working with is how can I become conscious of the reality that I'm creating and sustaining by the way I'm embodied. And I've, I find that uh, paying attention to the embodiment is the most direct access to helping people recognize the habits and beliefs and ideas that are shaping the reality that they've kept themselves in. It's like there's many rooms in a huge mansion and, and most of us are living in one or two of the rooms, you know, and there's so many more rooms to live in in life. So I watch for things like um, uh, postural habits and tension patterns and facial expressions and gestures um, and a whole kind of um, demeanor, call it, or bearing that suggests style. a style, the style. And the way the person is organizing their experience. Exactly. Experience. Yeah. And as you know, in Hakomi, we're watching for that, but we realize we, we're only imagining. We can only guess. But the beautiful thing about this method is that if I have a guess, what I like to do is create an experiment that will help the person become aware of, of, of what I've noticed or, or aware of something else that's an, a, a, a window opening to something about themselves that's been outside of consciousness. Yeah. And as soon as it comes into consciousness, there's choice. You know, if I, if I notice I'm, I, I always address somebody with my head turned to the side, and often this might suggest a, a kind of skepticism or suspicious attitude. It might be something else, you know, it might be a stiff neck. But the <laughs> stiff neck could also be because of this habit. So I don't know for sure what it is, but I want the person to discover that if, if, they, if they move their head and hold it differently, not because it's right or better, but just because it's different than what's habitual. Something about their experience might change. Yeah, and if I go back to my personal example, yeah. if, if I, I'm like, I present myself as to the world smaller than I am. And you see what you do even when you say that. I know, I do it on purpose. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm yeah, doing it on purpose. Yeah, I know yeah. it very well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. <laughs> and if we are working, you know, you, you are helping me to become conscious of that. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. well, it's as if you, you, you are presenting yourself as smaller than I am. I can realize that, oh, okay, yes, it's true. But in, in my experience, I've seen it with, with also with clients, with him, but also within myself. Right. If I start changing that, mm -hmm. and I, I change very slightly my body, and mm -hmm. it's not presenting itself mm -hmm. smaller than it is, mm -hmm. after everything reorganized through that expression. Right. And to me, this is a... Mm -hmm. I, I, I get touched right, when I say, you know, this is a very powerful way for transformation, because... Yeah. To me, it's easier to make little changes in the body right. and let all the rest reorganized yes. than, than change all, all the way you think about how you should pre be presented in life, mm -hmm. you know? That would be a way also, right. but this is very direct, very simple, very well, powerful. The body, the body patterns don't give way easily, as you know. Yes, I know. And uh, I, I got fascinated with it actually as a yoga teacher because I could see that people who came to practice yoga over and over again, lots of changes were happening. Um, and I changed my way of uh, assisting them from correcting posture, mm. postural habits or ha habits in the asana, I changed from with with uh, my new Hakomi learning. Instead of um, correcting a posture, uh, just assisting them to become more aware of what they were already doing and trying different possibilities. 
And this is totally comes from Feldenkrais method. But um, when people, um, if I notice something postural, for example, if I notice something like somebody seems to be holding themselves in a way that makes them smaller than they are, um, I'm less likely to have them straighten up. Although that, that is interesting, but sometimes people perceive that as a correction, as I, I, I'm doing this, I should be doing this, you know? Mm -hmm. And in Hakomi, it's not a correction, it's an experiment. You know, what else is possible? Me now, I see it as, a, as a, just a different option yes. that I have. Yeah, exactly. If I am aware that I'm presenting myself yeah. as more, yeah. I, can, I, I have this different option. Yes. Of, yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm not trying to go, but if I pay attention, mm -hmm then where mindfulness is key, right. the capacity for paying attention. And then exactly. if I am aware, I can be in another place, exactly. which is also another emotional and psychological place. It's a different way of presenting myself to the world yeah. after the, the perception of the world even changes. Yes, it does. That's, that's the, the amazing thing is the lens we're looking through, the way we're seeing things changes. Uh, th that example of the head turned to the side, I, in a Hakomi training group one time, I was aware that there was a woman who was having difficulty letting in any kind of nourishing verbal statement. Even when she chose a statement and had the partners saying it to her, something like, you know, uh, you're totally welcome here, or I'm glad you're here, something like that. She wanted to hear it, but she couldn't let it in. But I noticed she had this habit of listening with this, with this, you know, kind of doubtful attitude of her head. So I asked her if there was anyone in the room that she would totally believe if they told her, you know, I'm so glad you're here. And she said, my best friend is here. And I said, well, let's do a, an experiment. Tell her the words. And so she was across the room and we were in a circle and the friend said, so-and-so, I'm, I'm so glad you're here. And she said, I didn't even believe her. I couldn't even believe her. And I said, well, just as an experiment, because I noticed your head was like this, turn your head and look directly at her and let's just see what happens. Friend said the same thing again in the same way and they both melted. She melted, it went in, we all saw it go in. They came together, they hugged. She came back to her chair, she looked at me, and she said, it can't be that simple. It can't yeah, be that simple. Sometimes it is. It, when, when, you, when you say that, I, I was thinking, like, we have, the body is like a broadcasting emissary, you know? But yeah. it's also an antenna yes. that receives, and depending how is the antenna, That's right. it will be tuned to some information or not. Right. And if I stay embodied with my posture, with my way of using my body, with my facial expressions, if I stay embodied in the same way that goes with an old reality, I keep recreating that reality over and over, and even when life is offering me a different experience. So my, you know, what I'm watching for more and more in Hakomi is I'm looking for the way somebody seems to embody a state that, that, that's, that is limiting or causing unnecessary suffering. And what I'm also waiting for as we're exploring uh, is a, a spontaneous, almost natural, but very quick um, shift to something that, that looks different, uh, especially if it looks like it has more possibility of the person having a positive experience. If I can see it happening all by itself, I like that, I prefer that, and catch that, and help them stabilize that and study it, and then look at the situation they're describing in that posture. But if I can't see it, then I create an experiment, as you were describing. Okay, what happens if you, so you're embodying feeling small, what happens if you shift your weight forward? Sometimes I'll use my yoga background, and, and I know that if somebody shifts their weight forward, as you know, on their pelvis, the spine lengthens. So sometimes it's not about suggesting that they straighten up or look bigger or something. Suggest a tiny little change in some part of their, their way of organizing the body that you know is going to shift everything. 
which is really interesting. But I want to tell you a story about a session I did with a, a man where I used a very simple experiment as an indicator to kind of uh, let him experience something different from his old reality. And the, the fellow was not a Hakomi experienced client or let alone therapist. He was just a guy that wanted to sit and chat and have a Hakomi experience, but he didn't think he really had anything to work on. So he was, he was there in the chair more out of curiosity and it was a, a group that was watching me work with people. So I said, that's fine, let's just hang out, let's just chat, what's going on in your life? But I noticed that he had a very particular uh, habit with his body, which was as he was talking to me, he, he was continually doing this. You know, it was just so obvious. Everything he was saying, you know, everything's fine. You know, I'm uh, going to meet a member of my family soon and uh, that I haven't seen for a long time. And, you know, I said, I chatted with him. And then I said, you know, do you, do you want me to name something I'm noticing? And he said, sure. And I said, as you're talking to me, this is what you're doing. Well, he'd seen enough of the work to get curious about that, and so he just did this without speaking, and he said, I get it. It's my, my body is telling you, it doesn't matter what I say, you won't like me. There's nothing that I can do to make you like me. You won't like me no matter what. And I did a very unusual kind of experiment with him. I said, well, let's just see what happens if you nod your head and tell me that. You know, t go ahead, tell me that, you, that I won't like you, but, but do this instead. And it's just to break up the pattern, you know, because the whole pattern of seeing uh, through a lens which it has that expectation, nobody's going to like me anyway, no matter what I do, um, is carried in his way of, you know, just even that head movement. If that changes, he can't have the same lens. Yeah. So he, pattern. but it was, it was fun for him, you know, it was fun for him to say, you won't like me no matter what. And he started to laugh and sometimes the laughter, you know, almost as much as, or sometimes more than, than tears uh, is a signal of a, of, of something reorganizing and, you know, a real sign of kind of spontaneous transformation. You know, so I, I loved that little example because he, he'll do that, he'll do that habit still. You know, if we've practiced it long enough, we're going to keep doing it, but he won't do it unconsciously. And he'll more and more catch it and interrupt it. And actually, that's what I think we're assisting people to do. We're assisting people to notice the unconscious way that they're embodying and, and keeping themselves in an old reality that's, that's unnecessarily painful in some way, or at least limits them in some way from, from having the kind of positive or nourishing experience they could be having, that yeah, life is actually offering. Yeah, yeah. And, and maybe we don't, you know, get rid of our old habits, but when they're conscious, we have some choice. We, we can interrupt them, or we can reflect back and imagine doing it differently. That's usually the first stage, is notice, oh, I realize I just did that. Let me just go through what it would have been like to do it differently. And the next stage is catch it in the middle. Uh, oh yeah, I, I notice I'm talking to you like that or like that, you know. What if, I, what if I just play with changing it? How does that change? And we interrupt it and we um, reduce the intensity of the reactions. And that already just allows the kind of uh, different experience that, that, that in a way changes everything. Uh, thank you. <laughs> And maybe just to, to finish, what could you say us about just in the brief to about yeah this thing of, of everything is perfect as it is that we, we, we hear many times and yeah. then transformation where is the place if everything is perfect as it is where is the place of transformation right we you know we why we were gonna bring 
or be more proactive in, in transformation. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, we talk about the present moment and being present as if the present moment is static. The present moment isn't static. The present moment is part of something that's constantly moving and changing and unfolding. Life is, life is aliveness is constantly changing. So we're, we're you know, being accepting of everything as it is in a way is accepting that that as things unfold there's a there's a perfection to it i mean i love the idea of everything's perfect i'm yeah. organized around that and <laughs> and as a young person uh, that particular way of organizing to see things meant that i was often seeing what was imperfect you know i could mm -hmm. i could easily see what was right and wrong I could be a great proofreader. I can spot an extra ah on a page, you know, a. <laughs> but more and more I've grown to realize that if I am, am really recognizing that things as they are, uh, are are already perfect, it certainly doesn't mean a kind of passive approach to expect things to stay the same. It's nothing about that. It's about things are unfolding and my participation is part of that perfection if i'm here if i see something if i suggest something if you suggest something to me that's also part of the perfection if if an impulse comes up for you to offer something to me as an idea or as feedback or uh, just as an observation and um, even a criticism even that's perfect. If I can really accept perfection, I'm accepting the, the perfection of the way things unfold, including my participation. We're touching the principle of organicity, huh? Yes, <laughs> I'm the queen of organicity, and you call me. <laughs> That's right, yeah. And nature tries to show us oh, that yeah. over and over again. Yeah. So last night we had a party. So we're walking to the party, and what happens is a thunderstorm, thunder and lightning, and pouring rain and we just happened to be at a place where there was a cover you know we were under the bridge and so we couldn't make it to the party we were well, late for the party. It was great we, we did a great disco inside the, the, the bar. <laughs> it was it was so perfect you know I mean the weather we could complain about it and and or anything in nature and there's we, but we can look at nature and recognize how everything is part of a some kind of uh, beautiful plan and uh, you know it's easier to see I think sometimes in nature that there's no mistakes so how can we begin to include ourselves as part of natural life <laughs> thank you <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you such a good question yeah yeah thank that you. was fun <laughs>